Welcome everyone to today's online forum, Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management, from Policy to Practice, hosted by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre in partnership with Women and Firefighting Australasia and Victoria University. My name is Lauriana Bethune and I am the Research Utilisation Manager for the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. It's my pleasure to be your host today. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are joining this meeting today and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And to any elders joining us today, welcome. And to acknowledge the long association of traditional owners with the land, water and culture across the vast continent. Please note this webinar will be recorded for later online access. As attendees, you will receive an email when the video is available on the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC website. We have three speakers in this afternoon's webinar, Celeste Young from Victoria University, and lead researcher for the CRC's Diversity and Inclusion Building Strength and Capability Project, Quinn Kramer from Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, and Rachel Gutamapu from Fire and Emergency New Zealand. All three speakers will provide an introduction on how we can effectively implement diversity and inclusion policies in emergency management, and we will help us better understand the purpose of diversity and the critical role inclusion plays in the management of social, human, and natural hazard risk in communities and organisations. The three speakers will also help explain why diversity and inclusion is such a business imperative and where there are opportunities to build capacity in this area. If you would like to share your thoughts on social media, please use the hashtag BNHCRC. Before we get to our first speaker, I just wanted to provide a quick background to the Diversity and Inclusion Project. This project was included in our second round of research. It was really clear from many of our other social projects and also from our research workshops, that diversity was becoming a real priority for many of our partners without much research that sat behind it. We were really attracted to Celeste's proposal because it was very much about what the sector is doing right and how to capitalise on opportunities and really aim to examine some useful tools for the sector to adopt. Now, to further explain this important research, I'd like to introduce someone that you may already know, Celeste Young. Celeste is a collaborative research fellow at Victoria University and specialises in end-user-led research. Since joining Victoria University in 2012, Celeste has led research for the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, City of Melbourne, Victoria's Centre of Climate Change Adaptation Research, Department of Environment, Water, Land and Planning, and Department of Transport and the Rail Manufacturing CRC. Celeste is the co-lead of the CRC Diversity and Inclusion Project, Building Strength and Capability. Her work focuses on decision-making, understanding and managing risk and transformation. It is used by practitioners, trainers and researchers in public and private sector in Australia and overseas. She has also created a number of award-winning programs and communication materials, and her work has been featured in state and federal government policy. Welcome, Celeste. Look, thank you to the CRC and also to WAFA, and thanks for inviting us into this conversation. It's, it's very exciting to be part of this whole agenda and it's been an incredible three years. So what I'm going to be doing today is just giving you a couple of the key highlights in the research, a, a very brief overview and some of the things that we've developed with our partners to um, take that translation of research into policy and practice. So when we started, I think Basically what people, there were a couple of things they were asking us for. One was an evidence-based framework, which is basically a fancy word for organising the knowledge so people can use it. Um, and because it was quite a contentious space, people were saying to us, we really need to change the narrative here. We need to be able to have a conversation. And the other thing they really wanted was to understand how to capture and what the value was of diversity and inclusion. Um, just very briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, the research we do. We've been doing this for over 10 years, but we specialise in very much applied research, which is collaborative, it's end user led, and it's transdisciplinary. So what it does is it brings all the different expertise and knowledge together, and we work together to actually find the solutions within the research for it. And our focus is on decision making. We start with the end user need, work through their context, and always looking forward to see where it's going to be used. And as a result, we have the most amazing research team. I just want to briefly acknowledge, I know you probably won't be able to read this, but 
we have our academics, we have our academics from within the emergency service organisations. We've had people who've contributed in along the side, um, such as WAPA, who we've come together and collaborated with throughout this process. And then we have the organisations who've provided the environment and supported this research through it. So I just want to do a big shout out to that amazing team. Okay, and as a result, we've produced a lot of materials. Uh, to show you very briefly, I'm just going to be focusing on these two primarily today as the practical outputs to guide practitioners through. Um, and I just want to refer to these two. There's a couple of information manuals here as well in relation to called and young people, which will be coming out later. But basically, we're going to be looking at the framework, which provides the thinking and the concepts and processes, the overarching things, and learning as we go, which is a practitioner manual, which um, is slightly different to our normal ones, and I'll explain why later. The first thing we did was look at the drivers, because why was it so important to have diversity and inclusion? And basically, it's because the communities are changing. You've got far more people living in different places. They're more diverse. They're moving around or work prior to COVID. Um, and the risks they're experiencing over the last 10 years are really changing. The amount of times I've heard unprecedented has almost made it meaningless. Uh, people are experiencing things for which they don't actually have previous experience for because the risks might be the same, but they're manifesting differently. So that's why diversity and inclusion is really important because you have to reach a much broader range of people, the whole of the community, and you have to work with them and be able to work with them and use all of that diversity of views, thoughts, skills together to solve these problems. It's a big system-based problem. Okay, so one of the big moments for us, I think, that changed the conversation for us and the practitioners was halfway through we were doing a workshop. Uh, it was a scenario-based workshop. And we took them through a decision-making process and we asked their responses to the uh, diversity-based uh, scenarios and we said just give us your first response and these were some of the responses and what that told me is that these practitioners have seen this before and that they actually recognise these situations and as I was synthesising the rest of the material I realised that these people were extraordinary risk managers and mitigators and I thought why haven't we seen this before? Why is this being so invisible? And it's because of this. It's because it's about human and social risk. And most of the focus has been on uh, the, the actual physical risks and other risks associated with that, the more tangible risks. So we dug down into that bit to really have a look at and understand it. And you do that by looking at what's at risk. So we did it through what's called human and social capitals and the other capitals associated with it. And what that means is they're things of value. So human... Uh, capital can be things like skills, people's safety, all that sort of stuff. Social is like networks, trust, all of those things that are important. And as you can see, it's a really insidious risk. There are lots of things associated that, that, that diversity and inclusion both create and also manage within that context. And so it sits underneath other, under, other risks and it can amplify it. It goes across time and it can also impact other systems so your economic systems if you've got poor inclusion and or you don't have a good connection with your community doing response or preparation is much much harder so what this made us realize is that we would started with it being a moral imperative and the right thing to do which it is but the reason why equality and equity that big question are so important is because it's about human and organizational safety and well-being so the bottom line is, without this, people are less safe and more at risk and the impacts are likely to be greater. So that's why it's core business because that's what the emergency services do. They, the whole purpose is to reduce this. The other aspect that we were asked to talk to was uh, the economic aspect. So we weren't able to do a lot of economic assessments because quite simply the data is not there for a lot of them. But with one of the programs, which was the Fire and Rescue New South Wales IFES program, uh, it showed that there was an $8 million benefit to the community in relation to this. So for every dollar spent, there was $20 that came back. So that shows that there's actually a strong business case and the more data we can collect in this space, the better it is for making these cases back to, to leverage funding and also 
bringing in other stakeholders who are benefiting from it. But to make this practical, we really had to understand, you know, what diversity and inclusion do, because what is diversity? It can be a lot of things, and it's certainly it's diversity of thought, diversity of culture, you know, diversity of age, you can have diversity of skills. And whenever you put diversity, which is essentially different, into a system that's used to operating in a certain way and has a certain type of people in it, it creates change. Now, if you want to manage the risk that that creates, it's really important that inclusion um, is used because that's how you manage this type of risk. And the thing is, there was an assumption that if you put in lots of diversity, it would magically function. Um, it doesn't. Inclusion is, is the tool for that. And it's also incredibly important in terms of being able to the processes you use, being able to mitigate the innovation risk as well. Okay, so what we did is in the first we bit, we created, um, the first year we created this framework. We isolated the different areas through talking and working with the practitioners that you needed, and that's strategic. The whole process of change is a long-term proposition. And the strategic aspect is important for a couple of reasons. One is if you don't have a vision of where you're going, people aren't going to follow you, quite simply. It's not a comfortable process and it's quite unsafe. People feel quite unsafe in it. So they need to know where they're going. The other thing is it gives you the authorising environment. It provides the frameworks and the authorization for people to start to build within that and, and to work within it. Secondly, the programmatic process, because you've got a lot of social infrastructure that you have to put in place, what I mean by that is the relationships and the trust and the safe spaces to be able to do this, it has to be continuously assessed because there's also an innovation risk because it's got social innovation. So we have a continuous improvement process that sits underneath that strategic process to support that. But what's really important is this inclusive bottom-up growth, which is how you do this, because the tricky thing about inclusion is the decision to be inclusive is an individual one and you need to be able to have, you can have all of the policies and processes in place that tell people they have to be inclusive, but ultimately it's about an individual making a choice and they have to be brought along. You cannot force people to be inclusive. It's their choice ultimately and they will choose what they do. And the human um, and social risk management is what ties this together and helps you um, implement it, and I'll show you how. Okay, so basically, just very quickly, this is the transformation process that we developed. It's a mixture. It's a complex change process. It has lots of different things. And the point of this was to help practitioners understand what they were seeing, because a lot of them were saying we're getting lots of resistance and it's slightly alarming. Um, a lot of it was nothing to do with diversity and inclusion. This was just about change and very natural responses to change and innovation. So in understanding where you're at with this can help you actually be proactive because you can expect resistance at certain points. It's very natural. And being able to separate that from what's actually specifically diversity and inclusion um, helps you ascertain what skills and what needs you're going to have to meet at that particular point. In learning as we go, we've also put in um, a maturity matrix which can help you understand where you're at with your organisation because where you're at as an organisation and where you're at in this change process will determine what's possible and what you can do at that particular point in time. It's always better to do less better and more thoroughly than try and do everything at once and then just fall over because it's a huge task and it's long term. The implementation process is fascinating for me, perhaps not for other people. When you look at this, you don't implement till about three quarters of the way through the process. And if you look at a lot of implementation processes, that's quite unusual. And the reason for this is this whole infrastructure you have to get into place of the relationships and the trust building takes time. And you have to be realistic about what that takes. And getting everyone on the same page and understanding what you're doing is very important because that's what creates a safe space and that what, that's what gives you the mandate to operate within that and helps you maintain it afterwards when the program's gone. And this, this is like a little wheel that, that goes through the other process as you're doing it um, because what it allows you to do is 
that big process, you'll have shocks and sometimes it'll go backwards. And this process will pick that up as you're going along within your programs more broadly. So you can adjust and refocus and keep moving forward with that longer term vision. The great thing about the fact that we've decided to do this, some people were slightly alarmed about it too because they were worried that it would uh, make it much more technical and crunchy and dehumanise it um, for DNI practitioners, not at all. This is about humanising the risk process and understanding this type of risk and bringing it into those processes because once you start putting it on your risk registers and in your planning, it's in the system. And you can start building around that. So people need to understand the risk. They need to be literate in the risk. And you need to have the skills and capabilities to do that. And the systems and structures are still being built, particularly the measurement with inclusion is very much in its baby stages. So recognising all of those things helps you take it apart and figure out where you've got agency to act so you can have ownership of it from the bottom to the top of your organisation. So you've got understanding, acceptance and responsibility. So just very quickly at the end, the diversity and inclusion framework, basically what that gives you and what the research did first of all was figure out what are the thinking things, the thinking frameworks you need to have because there's no point in giving people tools if you're using the same sort of thinking because you'll just get the same outcome in a weird way. With the technical uh, sort of the practical support, learning as you go, we always have a sort of practice-based thing, but what we realised is in the three years we've been, the evolution of practice has been phenomenal. And it's not a fixed point process and it's not something, it's not a tick in the box thing. So what we've done is collected together 15 different case studies and believe me, there's lots more. We've scraped out all of the knowledge that we've all collected over the last three years and put in the key learnings from that as, um, as to what people feel our top tips for managers. There's also some tools in there that gives you starting points, but you have to look at it in your context and start to adapt it from that. You can't actually, uh, there's no one way to do this. There's a hundred different ways that are really specific. It's really important to have statements of inclusion. And we've, this is something that came out of the research is that making statements about inclusion doesn't help anyone. People who are in minority groups, need to be able to determine before they enter into the conversation what's important for them. And that allows them to actually negotiate. Visibility is important on three levels, making it visible, how you are visible as practitioners or people who are advocating for it and being authentic and making sure your actions match what you're doing because otherwise you break trust with people. And it really is about, uh, it's not about, the first person to get there. It's not about being the best person at it. It's about how we all get there together. Because one of the things when we started that was really apparent is people are saying it's like two steps forward, one step back. And that's because when it got difficult, people would leave the room or they would start, you know, pulling up the ladder on each other and doing things. So I just want to leave you with this thought. When things get tough, just remember, just keep standing together and hold the line until that resistance goes, because it will go, then take a deep breath and take the next step. Thank you very much. Thanks, Celeste. Um, that was great. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Quinn Kramer. Quinn is the president of WAFA and she joined Queensland Fire and Emergency Services as an auxiliary firefighter in 2008 for joining the permanent ranks in 2011, and she's risen to the rank of station officer. Quinn has been involved in the WAFA board since 2017. Take it away, Quinn. Thanks for that welcome, uh, Loriana. And I'd just like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which I'm on today. Acknowledge the people of the Coral Coast Islanders, their elders and their emerging leaders. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about a WAFA perspective of diversity and inclusion. But first, I'd just like to give you a bit of a background on where WAFA's come from. So female firefighters have been around in Australia since 1901, when the Armadale and Amazons brigades were formed. Now women have been involved in firefighting through many various ways, including the Second World War, in, um, when the women's fire auxiliary brigades were formed to assist the men. Now this was common practice until 1945 when the auxiliaries were disbanded and laws were passed to prevent women from 
joining certain paid occupations, including the fire service. Now, it wasn't until 1984 when the Sex Discrimination Act was passed that women were once allowed to, once allowed to become paid firefighters. So it's only a short history of firefighting for women across Australasia, but it's a proud history. In 2005, a group known as WIF, Women in Firefighting, held their first forum, which was brought together by Dr. Marilyn Childs. Further conferences were held in 2006, and as a result of these conferences, WAFA was incorporated in November 2007. Since 2010, WAFA has held a further five conferences, with the most recent being in Wellington 2018. Now, in 2018, WAFA set out to produce a number of legacy documents that will assist us in measuring and sharing practical solutions for inclusive operations of women going forward. One of the documents was a QFES workshop synthesis that was a collaborative piece between Janine Taylor from QFES, WAFA, and Celeste Young. This measures traits, values, and behaviours and systems that are in place across Australasia and rates whether they are always, sometimes, or never being displayed. And it was a promising workshop and it showed us that there is a lot of great stuff happening across Australasia and there is a capacity to build. I will share a screen at the um, end of my presentation where you too can be a part of ongoing research into that sector. The other document that we requested we created was the WAFA outcome statement. Now this statement was a collaborative piece brought together by a number of people and it measured a number of different practical solutions that are available to assist organisations and women in the future to increase inclusivity across the um, emergency service sector in Australasia. Now, I'm just going to talk to a couple of key points of that today. Uh, there is a lot of writing on the screen. You don't need to necessarily read it. The links to the um, both documents will be at the end of the presentation. So practical steps for rec recruitment. Now, there's a couple of key ones here. So it's a review of language to ensure respect and representation. And I'll give you a real life example of that. South Australian Metropolitan Fire Service introduced a couple of years ago, WAFA Wednesday. WAFA Wednesday is a great process and it's something that we've given a nod to today by holding this forum on a Wednesday. And it's a way that SAMPS has gone through to normalise women within their sector. And it's women from the behind the scenes, operational, and even men who champion the women within their organisation. And it's just about normalising and giving that view to the general public to show that women can be firefighters. Developing social media policies and presence to directly recruit women and support them as cadets. A couple of ways this has been done, QFES has got a great program with PCYC cadets in Queensland and the last two winners of the Youth Leadership Award or WAFA have been come from the uh, PCYC cadets in Queensland. Also, you can't look past uh, former WAFA president Bonnie McIntosh's great development within Fire and Rescue New South Wales with the Girls on Fire camps. Now that's bringing young girls into the fire service sector, giving them a taste of what um, firefighting is like. It's giving them at an age where they're considering their future and their careers and instilling and empowering them that they have the abilities, skills and confidence if they want to go into the future to become firefighters. Another key helpful step that WAFA has been involved with is Fire and Rescue New South Wales, female only pat for mills. So these are a couple of days that are normally held each year where WAFA assists Fire and Rescue New South Wales to go out and trial the Pat for Mills female only audiences. And this has been great success with the feedback that we've received from the different organisations, uh, from the different women, sorry, who've been involved. It gives them a space where they can be, feel confident and ask questions and track how they're going with the different various aspects of the physical abilities test, physical abilities test. And we have seen feedback from them that has increased the numbers of women who are passing this test. Another key finding from the outcome statement that a lot of our members have shown great interest in, and this was also reflective in our workshop synthesis, is leadership and mentoring. They are both keys for ensuring that women, when they come into organisations, are able to make their way to the top and also stay engaged in the workforce and be retained in the workforce. So it's been shown as well that women don't just need female mentors, male mentors are just as equally as good. But what we need to be mindful of is that it's the right model for those in the organisations, whether it's mentorship or sponsorship. Either way, as long as those in the, um, who are assisting the, men the mentees have institutional power. 
Now, WAFA has developed a number of mentoring policies that we've tried to roll out the last couple of years. But what we found through feedback from our members and what we're getting is that informal mentoring seems to be the most common way that people want to engage with us. And that's about the power of story sharing. So women just want to be in contact with someone who's had the lived experience. And that's something that WAFA can access uh, and give to those women who want, who want it. And finally, I hope I'm not talking too fast for you all, but practical steps for health and well-being. This one is becoming more and more prominent and WAFA is really trying to focus on it. So recognising post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth as unexceptional risks in the workforce. The protective factors, which have been highly evident in the last um, number of bushfire seasons and the family connections. So we need to acknowledge the protective factor for firefighters that are gendered and that is it plays a different role for men and women firefighters. Recognising the profound impact the harassment discrimination have and when they come on top of normalised emotional load and recognising the role of institutional courage in confronting discrimination, harassment and its power to transform our organisations. And probably a big one for WAFA is addressing the gendered health and wellbeing of the job. So this includes things like ensuring that maternity and paternity leave, flexible work for single parents, women returning from pregnancy, miscarriage and childbirth, the impacts of pre-menopause and menopause of suicide by colleagues, impacts of sexual assault, harassment, domestic family violence and impacts. And there's a few other things that roll into that that aren't mentioned. So when we talk about females in the field, especially going to deployments, we need to ensure that the policies and procedures are in place to ensure that women in the field feel safe and protected in the deployment aspect. And there's also some really key things that we can assist people who are interested in joining the fire services with in that terms of shared knowledge. One thing that's really not commonly talked about that needs to be more promoted, and especially the women that WAF is not afraid to talk about, is periods. A lot of female, yeah, pretty much every female will um, counter the issue where they have a period and they're out in the bushfire season. Wife is not afraid to talk about it. If you need assistance, you can come to us and we will share practical, real life um, assistance and tips with that. But one of the main things I think WAFA does is we hold a space within the emergency service sector for women. We've tried many times to articulate the energy that's created at the end of a WAFA conference, why people are so energised and engaged and can't and say they can't wait to come back. And talking with former um, WAFA president, Donna Wheatley, who was the president at the time of the 2018 WAFA conference when the outcome statement was formed, we found a Brene Brown quote, which articulates it pretty well. As the connection is the energy that is created between people when they feel seen, heard and valued where they can give and receive without judgment. And that's what WAFA aims to do. We welcome all those who support and encourage women within the emergency service sector to feel seen, valued and heard. And we hold a place for them in the emergency service sector so they can feel like they belong, even when sometimes they don't necessarily feel that in their own organisations. As I mentioned before, we do have an ongoing survey into the emergency service sector on the values, traits and behaviours that make inclusive organisations. You can, you can use this QR code or also the link at the end of the presentations on the Bushfire Natural Hazards website to participate in this survey. And that's all from me. I apologise if I uh, spoke a bit too fast, but I want to save time for a great Q&A at the end. Thanks. Wow, thanks, Quinn. Um, that's such a great summary of WAFA activities and, um, and WAFA in general. Rachel Utamapu who's joining us from New Zealand. Rachel is the National Manager of Women's Development for Fire and Emergency New Zealand. She's leading the strategy of development, planning and delivery of women's development program. This is a senior role with responsibility for working across the organisation to ensure that the programs are integrated and coordinated across policy, leadership development and training. She also builds and maintains relationships with external stakeholders, with New Zealand Police, Defence and other government agencies to ensure alignment with sector approaches to diversity and inclusion. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. All right, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Rachel Udamapu, toka ingoa, kei Foreign Emergency New Zealand aho, e mahi ana. 
Tenakoto Katoa. Uh, first of all, everybody, I'd like to um, thank you for inviting me to the seminar. And um, and thank you for sharing uh, Foreign Emergency New Zealand with you. It's been a crazy year for everybody, and um, it's really exciting to actually be amongst lots of other people um, sharing sharing our work. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our other speakers, um, Quinn Kramer and uh, Celeste Young as well, and also acknowledge the organising organising committee as well. What I'm going to talk about today is encouraging more women to join our foreign emergency services, um, as well as diversity and inclusion initiatives at uh, foreign emergency. So first of all, I really want to look at um, our journey uh, for foreign emergency. Now, um, we were previously uh, New Zealand Fire Service, as well as our um, New Zealand um, Rural Fire Authority. So Foreign Emergency New Zealand was formed in July 2017. Uh, we brought together 14,000 and people across 40 different organisations. And that meant that we brought all, all people brought different cultures and way of working and way of doing things. So that was a huge challenge for us in our organisation to actually bring everybody together and ensure that everybody was um, uh, felt inclusive, included, felt belonged to the organisation. So uh, we've had we've had uh, three years as being one organisation, and I think we're doing a really good job. Um, we've built up lots of relationships along the way, and now now we're moving forward into that next phase. So if we look at recruitment, um, I just really want to talk about recruitment first of all in two parts. So. Um, the first one is um, attracting the right people to our organisation. And um, what does that actually mean is that um, we want to, first of all, we want to make sure that we attract people that have the right organisational fit. So they want to come along to our organisation for the right reasons. They want to be there um, because of what the organisation actually our values are and our priorities. But we also want to make sure we attract people who have the right community fit. Um, so because of that, we need to actually understand who our communities are, what their interdependencies are, and, and actually what their needs are. So um, we also, I think it's really important, though, that we actually understand how our organisation is actually viewed by those diverse populations, because that will go a long way towards actually attracting those people um, to our organisation, but also developing strategies that are that are that are attract diversity um, and in particular in this case women. Um, part two of sort of recruiting is actually knowing who your existing members are, what actually their perception and experience of the organization is, because attracting diversity to the organization is the first challenge, but the second challenge is is ensuring that they have a good experience. And the people in our organization are actually key to the sell for our organization, uh, key to recruitment in terms of going out there and actually one, our community seeing what our organization is made of, but also to our people going out there and sharing their experiences of the organization in order to encourage more people to, to join. We need to have a good understanding of what our diversity needs actually are. You know, and we can talk about race, culture, gender, um, but also don't forget diversity of thought is really important. And I know, and I know um, Celeste, you touched on this as is that diversity is made up of so many, so many parts. And um, you may actually find that your organization is more diverse than you think. But it's really important if we don't know who the people are in our in our organization, we're actually not going to know. Um, we don't actually really understand what kind of people we need to attract and bring into the organization to reflect our communities. So our explicit focus for the moment um, for recruitment is without apology, is we are wanting to attract more diversity to the organization, as we all are, um, but of course, attracting more women. Our stats for female operational women in New Zealand, our career firefighters um, for women is around about 6% and our volunteers around about 19%. So, and we also know that our, um, our, as our statistics go, our research tells us that our women stay only half as long. So it's really important that um, you know, we need to address those factors. And I think you know, if we look at our diversity and inclusion or respect and inclusion, that goes a long way to, to actually solving some of those problems. Um, also too, presently women in New Zealand make up only 
around make up around about 50% of our population. It's also important to note that by 2030, more than 50% of our predicted population will likely identify as Asian, Māori or Pacific Island. So what we need to remember is that while we're recruiting for, um, for now and what our present needs are, we also need to understand that we're actually we're actually recruiting for what our for what um, our future is going to be like, and so we need to actually we need to know what that looks like. And Celeste, you also touched on the fact that our communities are changing, and so are our risks. So of course, when we look at recruiting for the future, we need to make sure that we are recruiting for that. So what are we, what are our um, recruitment strategies or our priorities at the moment? So we want to encourage more applicants um, and more community representation. So you know what does that mean? We want to identify what who our target group. Are. Now we are one organisation for the whole country, which you know I guess if you if you look at it, that that seems like quite a simple task really to recruit for our organisation. But our organisation is demographically and geographically different, so we need to make sure that we actually understand what the needs are right across our organisation, um, so that we can actually we can recruit from what those communities are throughout the out the country and for what our organisation, each particular region in our organisation needs. So our internal operational personnel uh, firefighters are really important in being able to share that story. Um, we also, as I say, need to understand our recruitment needs. So what are they uh, cross-regionally? Our urban and provincial career and volunteer needs are quite different as well. So in our urban areas are quite different in terms of our, our community and community risk, um, as well as in our provincial. And when we're recruiting for career and volunteer, that's we also need to take into consideration that people will come to the organisation for different reasons. Um, if we understand our generational desires, so we've had, we and, and you will all be the same, is that we've had generations of firefighters um, or firefighter families that have belonged to the organisation. So if we understand their why, we can capture that and we can actually work on that. Um, we use lots of research and evidence sharing from other organisations across New Zealand, as well as um, other fire services around the world as well. And I think, you know, that's part of us being here today, which is really important. Um, lots of multi-agency collaboration. So we collaborate with um, New Zealand Defence Force, as well as um, New Zealand Police sporting entities for you know post career, uh, post far, post sports career, engaging with people. Um, we also um, have created a platform for sharing um, storyboards, and and you um, talked about this, Quinn, is that you know story sharing is really really important as well. Um, one of the key factors in our diversity as well is encouraging women to think laterally, not only about um, firefighting in the organisation, but also look at the other roles and um, that we offer as well, like fire engineering um, in our comm centres, risk reduction, readiness and recovery, fire investigation, um, to name a few, so that so that women know that not only do they need to work up the organisation, but they can work across as well. Um, if we're just looking now to our um, journey across our, to create our positive workplace culture, we have a whole programme um, that's designed really to, to look at our people and ask our people what it is that their needs are in way of the organisation and how can we better ensure that their, uh, their experience and their journey in our organisation is a positive one. So we've created a whole suite of uh, resources. Uh, we have our diversity and inclusion strategy. We've created uh, a set of values that um, we've in, uh, launched into the organisation and from that comes our shared code of behaviour which everybody will sort of kind of feed into as well as what that does is it creates a sense of belonging for people in the organisation. We have some, uh, in order to create uh, for support for our people, our safety, health and wellbeing, I think once again, you know, you've both touched on the fact that the safety, health and wellbeing of our people is, is really, really important as well. So we have a, um, we have some really good, we've, we've had some um, really good um, programs that we've released that 
right across the organization. So no matter what part of the organization you're from, um, whether you're a career or volunteer, everybody's come through our safety, health and wellbeing uh, programs, as well as we've had national um, respect workshops as well. Uh, we've done a national workplace culture hui. Uh, once again, we wanted to hear, hear from our people as to um, you know, how they're feeling. Do they feel valued by the organisation? What do they bring to the organisation? And how can we ensure that their experience is a, is a good one? So I guess when you look at bringing a whole lot of organisations together, that doesn't come with your the adversity as well. Um, so we have a bullying harassment complaints process as well as a newly established behaviour and conducts office as well. And we have policies and procedures to, um, uh, to support that. One of the real key things that we've done is release this people survey. So we've gone out there and we've encouraged people to have their say so that we as an organisation can understand, um, understand what their needs are. But the key thing from those is the fact that once we've done it once, we actually need to follow up. So once we've delivered these new strategies or heard from our people, we deliver some strategies and, and processes um, to, to support what they've said, and then we need to actually follow up to make sure that what we're delivering is actually what our people want. And some of our major themes have been leadership, culture, and um, like I say, safety, health, and wellbeing. So, um, so overall, you know, as I say, we can't do it in order to be um, to attract more women to the organisation. We need to ensure that the organisation is a place where women in our diverse cultures want to come. Want to come. So we want to make sure that our, our people feel respected, um, they feel included, and they can actually bring their whole selves to work. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, yeah, what a, what, you really demonstrated how important recruitment and retention is to that, um, to that issue of uh, diversity and inclusion. So now we've got a few questions coming through. Actually, they're coming in thick and fast. Um, we'll try to get us through as many as we can. And to do that, um, I might combine some related questions and where it makes sense. But first, I'm going to ask, um, take one to the whole panel. I think this is an interesting question that's come through. What is the best way to change the perceived view of the boys club mentality and combat the effects of that view without dismissing the value respect of those that have come before us? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll come from my own perspective of being um, the first female to join my, my fire station and being the only female there for at least eight years. Um, probably one of the big things is, is creating relationships. I think conversation and relationships is what, um, what brings people together and ensures that actually you have that shared understanding because it's, it's basically about one person having one perspective and the other person having the other. So in order to, um, I think, kind of have that shared understanding is actually just create relationships where, whereby you listen to the other person's perspective and then you're able to share yours. Uh, yeah, I think what Rachel said pretty much sums, sums up a good example. And I'd also add to that about setting boundaries. Ensure that you set boundaries that are clear from the start so that further down the track that you don't need to have to backtrack at all and it looks like you're flip-flopping in one way. Quinn, uh, just some um, quite practical questions to some of your, um, to, some, to your presentation. Um, first, um, the first one is, um, how old are the girls that attend the camp, the Bronnie McIntosh camp? Um, and how are they selected? And what kind of activities do they engage in? And um, what do you feel like um, is the outcome of those for the girls of the camp? Bronnie, you can check out the website girlsonfire.com.au for more information. Um, girls register to attend the camps and I think it's, it's really great. Bronnie's been able to sort of make a, a virtually possible Girls on Fire camp this year to provide with the COVID restrictions. It's normally aimed for girls in years 10, 11 and 12. Uh, WAFRA in the past has provided guest speakers to go along. So Vice President Steph Louie, who's a, an aviation or she's a rural firefighter, but works in the aviation sector of the rules as well. She's gone along and given presentations. The girls have engaged in everything from practical firefighting skills to more behind the scenes stuff to make them aware of what's involved in the job. And really the outcome of the girls is just to give them a taste of what is out there and available in the emergency service sector. And it's around that time too, that women and girls are looking forward to what they want to do in the future. So it gives them, you know, something to aim at. And also, I think one of the great things that Bronnie's doing with that camp is inspiring confidence at a time when, you know, as a teenager going through that changing period, you can really take a 
confidence hit by what you're constantly bombarded with in, in the media and on social media platforms. And going out there and doing something practical like the Girls on Fire, I think it's a really great thing that Bonnie's doing and building their confidence and their skills and their knowledge. I, this, is a, um, this is probably a good question for both Quinn and Rachel here. Um, is there any evidence that supports differences of diversity in paid station agencies versus volunteer agencies? And what are the best ways for male leadership to support women in fire services, especially volunteering? There probably hasn't been um, enough research on, done on this and it comes across a lot of, sec um, of the different various things that we look at. Because the number of females is so small, it's really hard to get a really good analysis of what's out there, especially versus paid versus and volunteer. But one of the things that male allies can do to support women, whether it's paid, volunteer, is just get out there and be supportive and hold that space for women within their organisations. So too often it's males within the centre of power and by holding a space to allow women to be seen, valued and heard is one simple thing that they can do to give, empower those women. Um, the other thing I would say is make it visible too because often it's demeaned and women have a tendency when uh, we found that with DNI practitioners in particular to say, oh, look, it's, you know, what I do isn't really anything. You know, we really have to say, actually, no, what you're doing is really important and it's valuable. And I think those sorts of acknowledgements on a daily basis are really important because that's why it's so invisible a lot of the time is because when there isn't a dollar value attached to it somehow it, or it's not seen in the front. You can save as many lives through the right conversation at the right time in the right way as you can by fighting the fires. And with these out-of-box events, that's becoming more and more important too. And I think to add to that, um, Celeste, as well, is that it's that awareness as well is, yeah. is just um, creating that space of, of for particularly for our males and in our leadership roles like Quinn's talked about, is just have that awareness of actually the value of having that diversity in a in a in a um, brigade or a um, um, organisation and the fact that, you know, together we are more creative, we're more productive, you know, together we actually are better problem solvers and, and actually more innovative. And, and then that sort of takes away that barrier of that, that um, the gender thing as opposed to, oh, well, women are, you know, women wanting to come in. Actually, no, together we'll actually move forward and together we can actually be better. I think that, sorry, just to add one more thing to that, because I think the other aspect of that is it does need to be safe for women. And overseas where they had um, women, once they become visible, particularly in those managerial roles, and we saw this in another sector we assessed, they are subject to different sorts of mm. scrutiny. And you need, if for men, have proactive policies have proactive strategies in place like overseas what they did is they promoted a woman to an executive level in a fire agency and they all sat down and went what happens if something goes wrong what are we going to do so mm -hmm. think proactively about what supports they need because being the first and being visible is hard until it get until people get used to it but unless they have exposure they're not going to get used to it mm -hmm. Um, this is for all of you. So what evidence or experiences that you've had that increasing diversity actually changes the culture and the operation of an organisation? Or do more diverse people joining conform to established norms and culture? You know, as a minority, I guess myself, you know, joining my, my brigade um, 17 years ago, perhaps that, that may have been something that happened right at the start is that, you know, I, I feel like I maybe lost my own identity. But actually, once I established those relationships with the people around me, then it was safe, like we've talked about, it was safe for me to actually be who I was and, and bring my whole self to work. And so, so therefore, then by me doing that, that encouraged others to actually be themselves as well, which gives Gives you that shared growth and then together um, I think you know together you become better but you know sometimes these things take time as well and and I think we have to be patient but it also has to be a place of safety as well. Yeah look I think the other thing is is don't underestimate both the formal and informal what we call institutional structures which are the all the systems that hold in place the decision making and the responses and how you respond to things they take time to change. And I think, you know, in terms of this, it's, as Rachel was saying, it's a, it's a long-term proposition. And it really is about um, 
stopping that kind of conversation when it's about what you can see and really looking at what people have to offer and their value. Because once you start looking at that, who that person is is less less of a, an issue. You know, it's, um, particularly with communities and things when you've got incredible capabilities and mm. extraordinary talents and skills in there and, and in the workforce. And I think a lot of people don't, some people don't want to be visible and it's also recognising that. It's actually figuring out how are you going to make the best and help this person be the best person they can mm. in there. And safety, there's no point in saying people speak out if they're not safe to do so. If there's not the systems that actually support them or, or, or support managers in taking great steps and having those conversations, make sure they have skills to do that. This isn't something just anyone can do. So it's really about um, understanding this practice better and about actually giving weight and value and rewarding it as well. When people stand up, when people do facilitate those conversations, rewarding that on the same level you would other technical skills within your organisation. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Like, I think authenticity is the key. And I've seen a lot of um, organisational within my change within my own organisation, Queensland Fire. You know, from the time I've joined, you know, we had um, a number of issues that were, you know, highlighted in the media a long time ago. And uh, Katarina Carroll was brought into our organisation. And you know, all, the change was, was slow, but it's been steady and it's been building. And one of the greatest things I think came from that, um, that change in bringing her to the organisation, not just benefited Queensland Fire, but it benefited a number of organisations throughout Austral Australasia. And the fact that we had our first female fire commissioner, and it comes back to a lot of that, you know, you can be what you can see. And having her as a figurehead, someone out there putting herself up front authentically within the organisation gave and empowered everyone else in the organisation to take those steps as well. And certainly for me as a, as a female within the organisation, it, it empowered me to become more authentic and take those steps, steps forward in an organisation that fully, I felt fully supported me because it supported our leader as well. There, there is one other thing too, is you need to keep your foot on the pedal. This isn't an 18 month program. This isn't a stop and start thing. And you don't fix diversity and inclusion and manage it. So the fundamental headset of that is it's not a problem to be fixed. It's a situation that you manage to get the best out of that situation together. Um, I think that's really important too. Adding, adding to that as well, Celeste, is, you know, we can have, you know, policies and process and all of that. And, you know, and it's one thing to, um, I guess, to, hey, deliver. We've got this great policy and these great processes, but we actually have to live that as well. And that living needs to be, you know, top down, bottom up and all everything in between. And, and so, um, you know, we just keep going, we keep going and we keep going. And, you know, we, we'll have our, have our sort of, um, you know, recession, but then we just keep surging forward. Yeah, we have to acknowledge while well, policy and procedure is great, there's a great human factor in there and we can't underestimate yeah. the, the human emotion that's involved with the connection between people and their organisations as well. Well, the other thing too that's a scientific fact um, is that people actually experience change in their brains as patients. Differently. Uh, some people find it quite invigorating, other people find it quite alarming and it's I think it's also that sometimes the reactions you're getting, um, unless you can actually understand them, it's very hard to know how to manage them. So I think, you know, it's also about not making people feel bad because they're uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, you're in the right place. You're growing. Mm. And if you were to, to train for a marathon and get all that lactic acid, you go, boomer, you know, I've got lactic acid, I'm progressing. Whereas when we get mental pain, we kind of go, oh, my God, you know, something's terrible. Um, but it's not. There's good pain and there's bad pain and there's growing pain in this, which is a positive thing. So that discomfort, I think, is, is another thing too, is to work with that, not against it, um, from the managerial and the other side as well. Thanks so much. I'm really loath to leave it there. It's such a great conversation. Can um, I just say, Loriana, if people have questions for, for myself or WAFA, if they want to just um, either message the WAFA Facebook page or email us at info at WAFA, then I'll get back to them if I can. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. So it's really obvious from our speakers today that there's embers of good work being done everywhere um, throughout Australia. And um, 
and they might be small, but they're starting. And so my challenge to you, to all our viewers today is, um, let's help stoke those fires, make them bigger, make them more impactful. Because to quote the genius Paul Kelly and Kev Carmody, from little things, big things grow. So thank you, everyone. Um, the diversity and inclusion framework, along with the other resources mentioned today, are available on the CRC website. The links on the webinar event page will take you to the diversity and inclusion project where you can find all the publications. We're interested in your feedback on our webinars and we'll send you a link via email. It would be great to hear what you think about a webinar program. Thank you all once again for joining us today. We hope you found this webinar beneficial and we hope to see you at the next one. And I just wanna do a quick shout out to our wonderful communications team, Radia, Vaya and Beth. Thank you so much for all the help that you gave us. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you so much. See you next time.